Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode three of Listen. How we doing, Mark? All right, mate. Yeah? Good, yeah. Copenhagen. Good Cage Warriors last night. Amazing last yeah. night. Re- really good show. Um, yeah, the crowd were, I think the fights were good. Only seven fights. Yeah, but it felt like a long night, didn't it? It, I was, didn't feel like, it didn't feel like a short night to me. Nah, I think it, the crowd were obviously intense. Um, and yeah, obviously the main card, only four fights, but mm. I think each and every one of them delivered. Was there any, do you know you know about the fights on the card? Do you do any research before you come Sometimes, around? sometimes I look. Um, I knew like a couple of fights up with uh, 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 Mad, Madsen, Matt Madsen, yeah, Mark obviously Madsen, the, Mark the Madsen. Olympic um, mm. your silver medalist, wasn't he? Yeah. Great. Obviously, that appeals to me. Um, Dalby, a new Alex Lahore, I've known from the past. Um, uh, Matt Spinell, mm. there was, uh, I didn't know much about the undercard, yeah, but the main card, yeah, I, I tend to have a uh, have a look. And obviously, Cage Warriors are quite prevalent on social media, so yeah. it gets a lot of traction, yeah, and the and Ian Dean's a legend in the <sighs> matchmaking match game. What a matchmaker! I always, every time I'm watching these fights, I don't know how he does it. I don't know how he picks these guys to get the fights that we get. He's an like OG. Even the amateurs, even the guys that he's not really seen fight a great deal, yeah. he's just got a, he's got a feeling, has he? He's just like, yeah, that, that's that's. A good it's a bit like, uh, he's a bit like a James Bond baddie. Ian Dean is, because <laughs> if you look at the side, you know, he's just there, like he knows. It's almost like I've got a cunning plan. <laughs> you know, and he'll watch these fights unfold. He's yeah. an OG, Ian yeah, is. is. And anyone who's everyone in this game, especially in the UK, you know, you can trust me on that. Yeah, yeah. We know who he is. He's I called him the godfather, the godfather of European MMA the other day. 100%, yeah. mate. He's, he's, you know, he's he, lent me his he lent me his TV at UFC 95. He lent me his TV. So UFC 95 in London at the O2 Arena. Was that when you fought Markham? Yeah, it was, yeah. And I always used to take my Xbox with me, fight week, just to pass the time. It's the worst thing, fight week, because there's nothing to do. You're just kind of sitting around waiting. Um, and I got, to the t- I got to the hotel, tried to plug my TV in, and the TV's bolted to the wall, so I couldn't get all the, you know, the, the cables in and stuff. So got on the bat phone straight away, called Mr. Ian Dean, and he's like, yep, yep, come over to my house in Essex, and you can take my TV. I literally drove over to his house and he handed his TV through the door. Ah, well, I thought you were going to say he's, he's got himself on the tube with this fucking TV. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, because that's commitment. <laughs> yeah, that would be impressive. Yeah. No, no. yeah, let me his TV. And then as I was leaving the hotel on the Sunday, they thought I'd stolen it from the hotel. <laughs> so I blamed it on Paul stop, Kelly. Stop that, man. No, no, <laughs> Paul, Paul Kelly. Kelly. Yeah, Boy, off Paul Kelly. I remember that. Yeah, 95. I think that's... Um, I was refing Josh Koscheck in Paolo Tiago. Oh, yeah, that stole knockout of the bloody night from me. Yeah. The knockout of the night bonus. Yeah. I should have got knockout of the night bonus for that. Markham was out, kill shot and everything. Yeah, on Whereas, the tempo, I remember it. Yeah. Right hook on the tempo yeah. as he come marching Le- in. Left hook, right hand over the top, left hook Left counter. hook, was it? Sorry. Yeah. And then Paolo Tiago landed that wild left hook on Koscheck, sat him down in his ass and his eyes were just spinning, weren't they? Yeah, it was, uh, he, he, he wasn't happy about that, Josh, at the time. No. But, He's you know, anyway. in the words of Mickey Flanagan, <laughs> he was out, out. <laughs> he was out, out. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, at the time, it was so bizarre. He was like, because he jumped up and I was helping him, aiding him. Yeah. I, I remember that distinctly. And then when he finally came to, he like switched on me. I was like, are you kidding? I was like, you, you know, thinking he's going to watch the video back. But yeah, it's because th- nobody knew about Paolo Tiago then. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody. Was he like special forces or something? Like police special yeah, forces? Yeah, uh, Bope, I think it is. Bope. Bope? I'm, I'm sure, that I think that's quite the, as intimidating as special in, forces. I think that's the acronym uh, that they have, BOP. I think it's Bope in in, um, in Brazil. Great guy. Yeah. Lovely guy. I, I reffed yeah. him recently, actually. La- I think it was last year. He fought in KSW. Right. He actually fought in Dublin. He fought. He, he got knocked out, sadly. Oh, he it? fought Michael Matola. You know, people that... <clears throat> obviously, a lot of people, purists of <laughs> MMA, they'll, they'll know, obviously, KSW. Um, Michael Matola, yeah, he, I mean, he hits hard. Yeah. He's... he's. I didn't he, realise he was still fighting. Who, Matola? No, um, uh, Palatiago. Yeah, yeah. Not seen him for um, But yeah, Matola's a serious, serious guy. Mm. Very good. But yeah, KSW, and then we'll talk about it uh, yeah. some more one day. They've got another one coming up, haven't they? 23rd of March. Yeah, week at, uh, yeah I'm there the week after. You're going out for that, are you? Yeah, I'll be there in Woods in Poland. That's it. Uh, Woods. Week after uh, London. So it's yeah. London next week. Yeah. Or this week when this goes out. What do you reckon, Monday? We've got the Raptors behind the camera again. 
Slim and mystery. Big up to the Raptors. Big up to the Raptors. <laughs> Prowling around. He got recognised last night at Cage Warriors. Someone came up to him and said, are you kidding mystery? Well, I think what we should do is for the maybe show the little video of the Raptors yesterday in their Charlie's Angels. <laughs> I had a little, I got my own back. So he had a, a behind the scene. You were loving it, mate. That's going in. That's going in. Zoolander pouting and everything <laughs> you were. It's all on the video. Yeah, That's yeah, a yeah. behind the scenes footage. Put that Definitely. in. That's at the end of the podcast. We'll drop that in at the end of the podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wicked, wicked. So, you reckon? Oh, yeah. We oh, got you lying down. Beautiful. The little crazy horse pose. Remember when crazy Cut. horse used to win? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Three episodes in, podcast is over. Um, all right, let's switch. Let's switch track. Let's let's talk about the stuff that needs talking about <coughs> before we get on to some more fun stuff. There's been a lot of drama after the weekend, a lot of back and forth. You've been disagreeing with Anik a little bit online. Um, I saw Luke Thomas came out in your defence and did a great breakdown. So it's first and foremost. I mean, you're 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 at the at the forefront of it because you were the referee involved. But I think it it brings up a really interesting conversation about the sport, about what's expected of the fights in certain positions, and you're the best person to talk on it. Yeah. So talk about it. T t tell us what happened from your perspective and how it's played out and where you're at now. Yeah, it was, um, it's been a tough week, uh, a questionable week in terms of, you know, yeah, I mean, after the, obviously the fight you given reference to was the Usman Woodley fight and I'm in there and I'm doing my thing and reffing it as I see fit and, and purposeful you know at, at that particular time obviously unbeknownst to me I, I, I don't know what commentary are, are, are saying mm. that, that's not my job to concern myself with that I, I'm in the moment and, and, and reffing the fight so <clears throat> you know when the fight was over um, obviously I, I thought it was it was a good fight it, it was a uh, it was a slower pace fight, but very tactical. Obviously, very tactical on Kamaru's part. Obviously, done his homework, had a, had a methodical game plan, a solid game plan, and he exercised it to, to full effect. It was an amazing performance by him to be so dominant over, you know, a, a, a previously dominant champion mm. and someone as dangerous and as explosive as as Tyrone Woodley. It was um, it was an unbelievable performance from him. Um, but yeah, when obviously I came out and went back to the hotel and went back home and my phone was kind of melting again and I'm kind of like looking at it and, you know, I, I saw this like wave of like, you know, abuse for want of a better description and I really didn't understand. But then, you know, I was like, <clears throat> there's like two things because people say about you know, I've been doing this a long time, and you know that. But this past week, after that fight, I've had more, there was more interaction, shall we say, um, than I've ever had in, in 15 years as a ref. And I didn't understand it. Mm. Um, but then when I was looking into it, obviously there was the, the, the main, the, the bones of contention were obviously the fact that I stood um, Kamaru up from a position once uh, it was a 25 minute five round fight um, I, I, there was one single solitary stand up um, and I think obviously um, after uh, was the I made a remark to Kamaru <clears throat> when I said to him it's a fight and, and that obviously that caught a lot of um because I know that Joe Rogan had, had mentioned it on the on the broadcast. I've watched the fight several times for, for my own notation because I always do. Um, <clears throat> and I've explained that, you know, I'd I didn't I didn't really say too much, although I did say one thing. Obviously, with a so obviously I'm still in Vegas at this point, mm. and like I said, the wave of it was like you would not believe. I was kind of scratching my head. I was like, I didn't understand it at first. I, I really didn't. And then like I said, people are like, oh, you know, social media, ignore it. And I do want to ignore it, but because of social media, because you can at somebody, it's there. Mm. So I have to kind of, not read them, but you have to look at them to delete yeah. them and then choose to block these people and stuff. Yeah. 
<clears throat> so I spent a, a considerable amount of time doing that. Um, and then obviously it was the day after on the, um, on the Sunday when, when I was flying back home. And again, you know, I thought oh, it's going to die down a bit, you know, didn't say anything, did, didn't want to address it. And then um, stupidly on, on my part, you know, um, I saw a tweet I saw uh, John John Anik was talking about um, to to somebody answering about something, and I just saw this wildly inconsistent. And at that point, um, you know, I kind of like I thought better of it. You know, some of my I've I've typed out ten times more tweets and deleted them <laughs> that, than I actually have sent them over the years. You know, because normally I'll think better of it. Yeah, that's I one was, thing you and Forrest Griffin have got in common. Oh yeah, he used to write ten tweets out and only send one of them. He used to come and show them me in the morning. Can I send this? If you're asking me, Forrest, you definitely can send <laughs> yeah. <them. laughs> I probably once I retire, I'm going to send them all. <laughs> I'll, send them, I'll send them all in one <laughs> deluge. But yeah, so yeah, that's what I tried to explain to people. Is obviously, and, and I didn't know what was being said in in, in the broadcast, and <clears throat> and I went out with friends on the Sunday. You know, I was chilling out, relaxing, a bit of time, bit of downtime in Vegas. I went to NASCAR for the first time. That was that was a pretty cool experience. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not really a, I'm not a big fan of motorsports, but it was a cool experience. Yeah. You know, my friend Ralph, Ralph Cook. So thank you, Ralph. It's um, the atmosphere. At yeah, he sports. took it's care like of baseball. You know what I mean? It's like I never been to a baseball, baseball game. The atmosphere is very cool. Yeah, it was cool. It was something new, you yeah, know? You're there for like three days, but, you know, it's... <laughs> yeah. Well, it's they say fun. that to us about cricket. They're like, I don't watch that either. Like, what, five days? <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I went to NASCAR, and obviously all this was still, like I said, and that's what people don't get um, <clears throat> an appreciation for. It was like, it was just, it was unprecedented. It was unbelievable, the amount of you know, hate I was getting. And I was like, I just, I couldn't understand it. So I went out on the Sunday, as I say, had some food, went to NASCAR, had a few beers with my friends, blah, 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 blah. And this thing just wasn't letting up. And I was just looking at it thinking, you know, here we go again. Am I going to have to explain myself? Should I explain myself? You know, questioning myself, what am I, what, what am I going to do here? Um, and then I, I think I was flying home at like nine o'clock at night. And uh, I was looking at my phone. I was actually on the plane and I was looking at my phone and, and I saw that thing. It kind of just incensed me. And it incensed me because, you know, I was reading it, looking at it and blah, blah, blah. And I saw this inconsistent remark and I was, uh, for, the, for the life of me, I was still racking my brain thinking about, you know, what, what are you talking about? You know, there was, it was a full five by five round fight, mm -hmm. 25 minutes. I had one single solitary stand up, and, uh, and you'd not watched it back at this point. No, so you didn't know what the commentary had said. Uh, no, know? right, okay. No, I didn't know what the commentary. Said. Obviously, I knew that there was some. There was a backlash to me saying to Kamara, "It's a fight," and we'll get onto that and actually address that publicly. Mm. Um, but at that point, and then even my wife was like, "Man, what's going on?" Because people don't understand that uh, my wife's been a target of social media. That's madness. My son has been a target. He's had back and forth with people. Not, and I've told him, you know, you got to stay away and mm. blah, blah, blah. And when it gets to that stage and people will, uh, people will, they'll, they'll send me messages and then insult my wife. You understand me? Yeah. That's ridiculous. And so there's, so there's that to deal with. And I'm like, all this is swirling around in my mind. And I'm really pissed off at this point. I've had enough. And then, um, I'm trying to break it down methodically. And then, um, I saw this tweet about the wildly inconsistent and I thought, you know what? I fucking, I, I can't have this. And I typed out and I, I just said, you know, I came back and said, you know, basically worst the effect. I went, no, no, no. You know, what's inconsistent here is, is your recollection of, of the events. I was kind of like thinking, well, why were you saying the things you were saying on the broadcast? And then I was sat there on the plane thinking, if I send this, I kind of feel it's going to light the blue touch paper. Yeah. But I was so emotional at the time. I was really, really angry. I was angry because I was confused and a bit upset about, you know, the the, the level of uh, the level of 
message and abuse I was receiving and um and and, and I didn't fully understand it. So I pressed send. You know, I sent the message, like reply I was I was quoting John and and I replied to his tweet saying about I thought that hang on a minute mate you know I, what I thought was inconsistent was what you were saying on the on the broadcast and I didn't understand and then I was on an 11 hour flight from Vegas no going back so you farted in the lift on the second floor and left them to go up to the 56 <laughs> <laughs> good. that's a good analogy and then uh and then I left it obviously I went home arrived back in London turned my phone on <laughs> you know you know meltdown and um and me and John had uh, John had we'd spoke to each other via DM, and he'd he'd since apologised um, and said you know and he said it publicly too. And I'm going to leave that there because that is what it is. It was what it was. And um, you know I I said something there. I didn't directly attack him. I was saying about you know he directly attacked me and he referenced that and he said sorry. So it's parked. It's done. It's it, it's finished. Um, but then obviously I was into the analytical mode. I was thinking, you know what, I really, for the life of me, I still didn't, I'm like, I do this all the time, you know, and everybody's like, obviously there was, they were questioning why I was separating the fight. They were questioning why I was separating um, uh, Kamaru from, from Tyrone at certain points. And like I say, I could tell you the fight back to front now, mm -hmm. you know, four five by five minute fight, um, there was a total of three interactions from me from a separation point of view. And then obviously, because all the tweets, and like I said, you know, I keep saying then about I'm big and ugly and this, that and the other, but it gets to a point where it's not about being big and ugly no more because people disagreeing with what I do, that's part and parcel of the job. It goes hand in hand and, and I accept that. That's what's gonna happen. Referees will make decisions, not all, like I said in my last tweet, and I'll be off Twitter for the foreseeable, <laughs> but I'll get onto that. Um, you know, we are paid to make decisions, not always popular, not always correct. You know, and it was it was like this repeated theme of the hate. You know, you do this, and I'm like, hang on a minute, guys. You know, I I spoke only a few weeks before when I I said about the Sam Alvey thing, mm. and I served myself up on a plate, and said, you know, uh, you know, I said I was. I think on another day I could have done things different. I'm sorry, blah, 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 blah. And then it just kept, hopefully this is making sense, mm. piecing it together. And it just kept going round and round and round. And I was like, I just couldn't understand it for the 10th time. And I watched back the fight. And would I have done anything different in the fight? Maybe, possibly. I remember the, the first separation. So there was a five... Uh, round fight and the first separation was at the uh, towards the end of round one and uh when i was trying to explain to people when you have a fighter in a standing position when the fighter who's in front pushes you against the fence if the fighter against the fence is holding and doesn't fight back it kind of puts even more onus on the guy in front if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And and Ty, let me, Kamaru was, was doing some magnificent work at points, you know, digging into the body and did it. Like I said, take nothing away from, from, from what he achieved. It was an absolute, nothing but respect and admiration. It was a fantastic performance, worthy champion, blah, 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 all of that. But then I'm breaking it down from, from my point of view. And people are talking about, you know, what my job actually is. And, like I said, so the first separation ended round one. Nothing was said. Nothing. So separated, the, the round ended. Round two, no separation, no stand-up, no interaction. In fact, at one point, um, again, it was a very dominant round for, for Tyrone. Uh, sorry, for Kamara. He took Tyrone down, passed to Mount, kept a low hip grapevine Mount. Mm -hmm. You know, very methodical in what he was doing. St didn't say a word, left them there. And he, he was there for a large portion of that fight. Obviously, mm -hmm. I'm not going to stand a fighter up from Mount and I'm not going to interact or say anything. So just left them there. Happy days. Third round, um, again, uh, Kamara coming out, taking the front foot, pushing Tyrone back. Um, and like I said, I, I didn't know. I was thinking, I remember thinking in my mind at this point, like I was waiting for um, Tyrant to maybe explode into life or whatever. I don't know. I was thinking, is he injured or this, that, and the other? It was just a maybe. He was just having a tough time. It was just such a dominant performance from Kamaru. All of the above. Mm. 
and he pushed him against the fence again. He was doing some great work, digging under, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <clears throat> but I'm asking the fight to what what I'm put, put it this way. <clears throat> People don't understand as a referee, you know, sometimes where it's not about adversely affecting or falsely affecting the outcome of a round or a fight. That that's not what I'm there to do, but the fight has to move and in terms of progress. And if I'm standing in a position, a particular position with a fighter, you know, if I'm kneeing somebody in the leg or I'm digging into the ribs, yes, it's it's gonna it's accumulative and it is gonna hurt and it is gonna wear them down. But if they're staying in that position, that's when I'm I'm looking for a bit of natural progression. You know, maybe do a little bit more, try a little bit, and I'm trying to, you know, edge them on. Then when I thought it slowed down, I separated. And they cut, and then Kamara did the same thing again. Marched forward, took the upper, took the front foot. Mm. That was the third round, right? That was the third round, right. uh, and actually had um, there was two separations in the third round. Left them again. Uh, Luke Thomas done all that. I'll come on to that. Like his analysis was was incredible, wasn't it? Mm. It, bl yeah. it blew me away. Yeah, he's um, great, Lucas. And then I had a separation at the end of the third round. I think that's, but I listened back in the commentary. That's when the commentators were starting to question, saying, I don't know why he's separating. Okay. Then um, <clears throat> in the fourth round, that's where the, uh, where the stand up took place. It was quite early in the round. Uh, again, Kamaru out, front foot straight away. The aggressor pushing back, pushed Tyrone to the fence. He didn't actually take him down this time. The reason Tyrone went down is because he jumped to guillotine. Mm. He jumped to guillotine, went down. That was at something like four, whatever. Like I said, Luke Thomas's analysis was amazing. So they went down. They went back and forth a bit. Tyrone was, I think he closed his guard again, went back to a four guard, went to half guard. Kamara was still doing meaningful work at some points, and you'll hear me implore and, and ask them to do a little bit more. Um, that, was, that was when Woodley was like cramped up against the fence. Yeah, wasn't it? they yeah. exchanged a couple of positions. Mm. Woodley managed to retain close guard again yeah. at one point. And again, so if the guy who's on his back gets to a close guard position, I'm not going to reward him necessarily for step because that can place the onus on the person within the close guard to do something about that. You know, do some work, get out of there, etc. And, and, and I gestured to them a couple of times, said, come on, go, look, I need... Torrent had risk control, not much was happening. If you listen back to the broadcast, the first person to mention that was actually Dominic Cruz. He actually says, I think the referees may stand them up here because not much is happening. Torrent's happy to there. And I was looking at that. Then, like, 30 seconds later, I think John Annick said something, or Joe, and Joe had said, I hope he don't stand them up. And that's when... I think Dominic had said, um, no, I'm not saying he should, but blah, blah, blah. They're the words. So I decided to stand them up after two and a half, maybe three minutes on, on the ground. And then obviously the famous part in the fight when I was saying to Kamaru, it's a fight. First things first. The only reason I said something was because I was at, you, you, you may or may not have heard it on the broadcast. Yeah. When I said, stop, Kamaru said, what, why? He asked, he said, what, why? And then when he stood up and I went, Kamaru, it's a fight. That was my answer to him. Um, I've since addressed that publicly and said, obviously, I know now how that came out because the vast majority of people at home would see me separate a fight, a dominant yeah. guy, stand him up and go, it's a fight. Yeah. Thinking that's just something, I would never do that in, in my life. You don't hear uh, Usman say anything on the broadcast either. No. You don't, because you, you, you constantly see the side and the back of Usman's head. Yeah. So as he's walking back, I mean, I knew he'd said something to you because I know you well enough that you wouldn't have said that unless you were replying to something that yeah. he said. But you don't hear that on the broadcast. So it just lo does okay. look like you go, it's a fight. <laughs> Like you push it back in. Maybe, maybe if you if you turn up the mic, you, hopefully you'll hear it. But yeah. but that's what he said. You know, he said to me, "Why?" And I went, "Kamaru, it's a fight." But people and I can I can forgive. Is that the wrong word? I don't know. I can understand why people at home are like, "What the? Why would he say that?" Because mm. that's what Rogan said on the broadcast. Well, why has he said that? And I've since publicly addressed it. You know, I said if I caused there's one person I care about in this scenario, and that's Kamaru. If he thinks my choice of words offended him, then I was deeply sorry because that's not my intention. Never in a million years. Um, but I didn't have time to go. I'm not going to go time and launch into a big diatribe. But Kamara, I need you to progress, work, da 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 da. It was the first thing that came. Kamara, it's a fight. It was a poor choice of words. 
in that particular scenario i've addressed that i said sorry i said i think maybe i should have used different wording but the point to get across is i didn't just say it off the top of my head no. i was replying to his question it was the thing is as well as a referee in that space and this is why you're so good and why uh, john mccarthy was so good in the beginning in, in yeah. my opinion because you have to control that space you have to be the authority in that space and you have to be succinct with what you're saying to the fighters. So you haven't got time to go off in an explanation about what you need to see more from Usman. That yeah. was your reply because that was all there was time to give. Yeah. And, and, and I get it. And I know that you wouldn't have said that without him saying something Necessarily. First. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And then obviously that's when it really went to town on the so because Joe had obviously said, and this, you know, he's reacting. He was just pointing out and, and doing his job and, and commentating. Well, why has he said that? Why would he do that? And then <laughs> Dominic made a, a, a comment about, well, he done that because he doesn't understand wrestling. Mm. Yeah. Which um, I was deeply offended by because I'm Mark Goddard's wrestling coach. People know how good I am at wrestling. <laughs> I can't believe they would have said that. <laughs> Dominic said um, on the broadcast, well, he's doing that because he doesn't understand wrestling. I'm like, please don't be so disrespectful, Dominic, because I would never decry your credentials and the respect I hold for you as a as a fighter and uh, an athlete and, and a former champion you know i do know wrestling very well and those who know me will know i know wrestling very well um and at that particular point tyron's moving from on his back in a closed guard that's not a wrestling position mm -hmm. that's a jiu-jitsu position but he, he said what he said and <clears throat> that was his point to make at the time you know whatever i'm not going to continually fight fire with fire um and, and 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 that round finished um but yeah it, it did hurt me a little bit when when he said that you know because the thing is on that broadcast look that people believe what people hear you know and people haven't well first of all people haven't got the time the inclination or the interest to look into me as an individual they don't care what my credentials are as you know from jiu-jitsu wrestling mma they don't care and you know i understand that but obviously when you know when the commentators are saying particular things it's it's gospel to a lot of people but whatever mm. um fourth round finished fifth round came out again much more of the same from kamaru front foot again dominant took him down spent quite a lot of the the finale of the round in a half guard position you know working damaging nothing from me no interaction zero and that was really the tail of the tape mm. you know that was the <clears throat> that's what happened really start to finish and then again obviously like i said unbeknown to me I, i'm 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 wildly unaware of, of of what's going on and um that was my explanation of the fight obviously after that i've kind of explained what happened with the social media interaction uh, john said what he said he apologized blah 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 and 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 that was it um i didn't really want to say much else uh, about it but then when uh, i was thinking about it and then i listened to you know everybody was sending me things i was listening to brendan sharp i was listening to matt sarah i was listening to john and ray like listening to them all you know that he's arrogant is this you, know, you don't know the first thing about me and if that's your opinion of me you know i can't really do much about that i don't want to fight fire with fire you know i I can do, I can control what I say. I can control what I do. You know, and uh, I know I know who I am, but more importantly, I, I know what I am and I know what I give to the fighters when, I, when I'm in there. But um, yeah, in, in, in surmising, God, I feel like I'm rumbling on forever, but in surmising, obviously after that, after that fight, you know, the, the amount of in, interaction, it, it made me question like I had one foot out the door this this past week mm. and and that's no lie especially when it gets to like the family scenario because you know my my we got you know my wife we got three kids our youngest is um he takes a lot of looking after that's you know that's what I'm going to say and you know I feel, I feel guilt and, and like you know when it gets to that cuz I'm working the weekends and I'm thinking to myself you know is th is this worth it should should i be doing this and then um i, d I did I, I genuinely had one, one foot out of the door uh, at one point 
and then I kind of like snap back into it and realize I'm it's my job I'm, I'm providing for my family I'm doing what I'm doing and you just you know, it comes back to the big and ugly scenario again mm. but it but it, I'm not gonna lie it, it did affect me it has affected me to the point where I'm gonna press the reset button on quite a lot of things now I'm not gonna change how I referee um, I'm not gonna change my style of refing because I believe it's got me to where it's got me today at this point. Not to say I don't ask questions of myself because I do a lot, more than anybody will ever know. But um I'm just gonna I'm just gonna reset on on a few things and you know, Twitter's one of them. I won't be there for the foreseeable, if ever, maybe I don't know. Um I'll just keep like my Facebook which is personal, it's a family and friends thing. Um and I'm just like assembled with the podcast. Maybe this is the last podcast. I don't know because I think I just need to just go back and rediscover why I'm doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. You know, this this sport's ingrained in me. I'm I'm passionate about this, and that's what. If you love something, then you care about it. If you didn't, you'd be up and down. You walk away without a consequence. Yeah. But obviously, I can't do that with MMA. <coughs> because I don't want to do it. I'm married to it. I love it. And if you love something, you have connotations and emotions attached. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to sink back down a little bit and just concentrate on, on on what I'm doing. From a... Actions always speak louder than words. Always. Uh, none more so in our game. Mm. And the thing is, like I said, I've said it before. I've said it for years. We are fucking... I am damned if I do and I am ultimately fucked if I don't because people used to say these referees, they're never accountable, they don't speak, they don't tell us what they want, da -da. but then I come out and I speak, I'm accountable, but I want camera time or I want to be famous <laughs> or I'm arrogant. If I try and explain myself, it's not what people want. So, like I said, I'm I'm going to go with the latter um, and just, like, you know, disappear a little bit mm. and just concentrate on my love, which is MMA, yeah. and, and leave it down to the performances because what else am I to do? And the kind of thing that really made, like I said, I haven't spoke about it. I had the series of tweets to Luke just to clarify a few things. Obviously, on the, I didn't understand the backlash. I think the responsibility that commentators carry is enormous uh, also. Um, and um, yeah, I'm just going to, like I said, you look at the video, Luke Thomas, you guys obviously in MMA, you'll know Luke Thomas, the analyst and, and broadcaster and radio host and everything else. Yeah, he done this video that was absolutely blew me away. he done like a full round by round analysis mm. and he's we'll put the link up. we'll put the link up sorry the, the link will be in the comments so you yeah. can check it out it is and great. I, obviously I, I don't I don't know Luke personally I don't have any interaction with him but he'd done this video and it was it was absolutely incredible and he kind of broke it down and looking at it from, from my point of view and he put the time stamps in there talking about and they're basically saying guys what are you talking about what well, he goes he didn't do you know he kind of finished but going didn't do a questionable job. He done a phenomenal job, and honestly, my heart goes. My, my thanks is more. I emailed Luke. We've had a, an email exchange back and forth um, because I'm more thankful that, than he'll ever know. Because I thought I was going crazy. Yeah. I thought I was a little bit mad. You know. Obviously, Luke said that he he didn't agree with uh, obviously the, the 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 it's a fight remark. But hopefully, I've explained that now and the fact that I would never do that in. And here's the point, the other people like who are, they say, oh, Goddard's this, he's arrogant, this. Most people's reflection on me is, or when they'll first get to see me, uh, is as an official, as a referee. I'm in an authoritarian role. So what, what do you want from me? Mm. You know, if I see fighters do something and we leave it untasked, we'll, we'll get ripped. If we see something and, and, we, and we do react in it, I want the limelight or I want to be in. Like I said, you know me, Dan, thankfully. And, and many other people know me. And that's the last thing. I w I've said it before. I've had fight of the year candidates. For classic. We were just talking about one. Yeah. Uh, um, Johnny Hendricks and... Um, and Diaz. 
and uh, no, 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 Johnny Hendricks, Carlos Condit, oh, Condit talking sorry. about them. Talking Remember about Brian Stan, the, Vandalay Silva. Yeah, it was on the Diaz. Just yeah, it was the it was the co-main event. Yeah. The the Aldo and Mendes to all these fights and my utopia, my mo modus operandi for me is to not say anything in a fight, contrary to wildly popular misbelief. Mm. You know, if two fighters are fighting, great. That that's I just let them do it and. My job's there to, to interact or react to something that either makes the fight progress and do as it should or, or act upon, you know, a foul inflicted by a particular fighter. And that, that's all I want to do. You know, like I said, I'm I'm not going to... I'll change the way I do some certain things. And like I said, I'm going to hit the... I've hit the reset button. And like I said, ho <laughs> it's probably our last chat for... Uh, a while if ever whatever you know we'll wait and see what happens yeah. uh, i'm sorry to people that maybe wanted to hear hear what we do because we have a good relationship and i enjoyed the first two episodes <laughs> might be the shortest podcast in history <laughs> but hopefully you'll understand that yeah. you know you'll see that and like i said the damned if i do if you look at that breakdown that luke thomas did and then it's you know you look at the comments in that section, the comments that he does, it's like, that tells you alone. It's, you know, I, 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 an official simply can't win. So it's best just to, you know, the public are like this. I can't see. I can't see. Look, move your hand away. Ah, that's, <laughs> you know what I mean? That, and that's what it's like. So, yeah. and then it's like I said, the personal abuse and people are like, you don't get it. You, unless it, you fucking, you just don't get it. You know, like I said, you say it doesn't affect when it's your wife, and you that's a different ball game. Mm. You know, like I said, genuinely, I had one foot out the door, but I'm like, what are you doing, Mark? You're going to waste a lifetime's work in doing this. So I'll give people what they want, and I think by and large, that's for me, referees to remain silent. So that's that's what I'm, I'm going to do. Um, and I think I've explained enough about that, you know, hitting that reset button. Yeah. I'll go, I won't change what I do because I believe in what I do. I believe in uh, my referee. Uh, sorry, I believe in how I referee, obviously. I'm different to other people. Some good, some bad. Um, but it's got me to where it's got me. And um, that's what I need to concentrate on. Yeah. So just suppose that the fight's ended... You've not been Did I on speak social. for too long then? No, not at all. Not <laughs> at all. It's important that we hear this because people don't hear this in 140 or 280 characters or whatever on, on Twitter. You don't get this saying it's important. If you hadn't have interacted at all with social media, if you hadn't have had heard any of any of what the commentators have said, anything, if that fight ended and you left, you came to Vegas, you were here at Cage Warriors this weekend and nothing else had happened, would you look back on that fight and think to yourself that it was anything different to any other fight you've refereed? Never. So it's it's only the backlash. It's the backlash. Obviously, like I said, that the question of what which I've said, or, you know, I have said sorry, but I can say I can understand because people see me stand a fighter up and go, it's a fight, mm. without them hearing the interaction for him asking me the question. That's the, the only reason I spoke. I, I get that. I under, I'm not stupid. I understand that because the people at home, that's how it looked, and then it was exasperated by Joe, who also was at the point. Excuse me who also was at the point of not hearing it, saying, why has he said that? They didn't know it was me answering, you know, Kamaru. And here's the weird thing. <laughs> out of everybody involved, obviously Tyrone's kind of, he's not going to say anything in this because it didn't affect him. And I, to my knowledge, Kamaru didn't say any, any, anything, you know, uh, after the fight. And he may have his own thoughts. You know, obviously we went to meet the fighters, but as we do, I'll go to speak to them um, before the fight. I had a fantastic interaction with both of them Kamaru and Tyrone full of respect full of you know everything it should be they let me speak I let them speak and uh, everything was great and it, w it was set up for a full you know as it normally is my normal MO um, but yeah after the fight like I said if, if I didn't well, I guess it is because if I didn't see or didn't have social media or didn't have I didn't but then people are people are also telling me mm. You know, but just draw a line under all that. If if you'd not had any interaction with anybody about the fight, yeah. you'd have ref that fight, you'd have left, and you'd have not thought it was any different to any other fight. No, no. I mean, I could, like I said, I could have looked back and went, could I have left them a bit longer? Maybe. Could should I have left them in? You know, in the third. Like I said, 
25 minutes the people and that's what i said i've said this before about like i said the, the tweets people tweet me and disagree and I, of course that's fine you're okay to disagree but like i said and i'm talking i couldn't put a figure on it hundred several hundred messages across my various platforms you know and obviously like i said it's a direct at mm. so you're either choosing to block or just to mute and and i'm thinking i'm not going to enter into a dialogue with anybody people disagreeing and questioning you there's some wonderful people out there there's some like i said the fans and to me like the true fans to me are the fact the guys who are in there in that arena who've parted with their hard-earned cash not the guys who are sat at home in their bedroom you know, dick in one hand and keep <laughs> keyboard in the other. Because those people, let's be honest, mate, they don't go to fights. No, they they don't. don't. That's why you're at home yeah. online yeah. to 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 but cuss. That's why they're so bitter and angry Of course, online, to cuss me or cuss a fighter or cuss a commentator or cuss a there. You know, the true fans are the ones who are there in that arena. They're not on their phones. They're watching fights, having good times. Mm. And and that doesn't go for everybody. Like I said, I still have the the notion that most people are good people. You know, mm. and I've met some amazing fans in in this sport, but sat there was horrid, acidic plethora of individuals that just that's just what they do. Mm. You know, what yeah. do we do? Can, can I ask you questions about the, the technical stuff in the fight? Yeah, about so because because. This is something that I've I've been stuck on, and I've never really figured it out myself. I've never really we've never had a discussion about it, and you are the person to talk to. I'm a big believer in, believer in a game plan, especially over five rounds. And when you've got someone that like so, my my opinion of Kamaru's game plan was to come in and to tie tie Tyron Woodley up as much as he can, beat him up slowly, and wear him out as much as he could. Mm -hmm. At what point? So like. In the first three rounds, I can say, right, I can see this as his game plan in order to be very effective in the last two rounds. Uh -huh. But then that puts me in a position where I feel like I would be judging his actions in the first three rounds yeah. differently to the way I would in the in the last two. So at what point do you... Because in that over-under clinch where he's working the body and he's landing knees and stuff, at what point do you feel like the game plan's kind of ran its course and it's time to now start the Okay, interesting moving? point for, for you. People won't get it. I don't care how many rounds. Mm. I, I don't take in... I can't take into consideration, remember what I said? Can't be preoccupied with what I think might exactly. happen. Exactly. My favourite. I don't know if the fight's going to last five rounds. I don't know if it's going to finish in, what, in a heartbeat in a second. Mm. I'm not giving a fight a preference over what I think his game plan may be. That's not my job. My job is to deal with what's actually happening or happened, not what I think may happen. Mm. Happened, happening, happen. Difference. I'm not there to give... I can't say I'm going to... Put it this way, if a f fighter raves fighting and I go, I better leave him there because he might get tired in the fourth and fifth. And I know it's his game plan, so I better let him work it. You understand? Mm, yeah. I'm not there to dip, to take into consideration a fighter's game plan. Mm -hmm. I'm there to take into consideration what's happening at that in the moment, you know. And obviously, in, in some you, you play out strategic battles in MMA. The, the, you can't sprint. You know, I, I don't expect the fighters. And like when people say about, this is the weird thing that really fucks me up in the head because people are like, people are like you fucking keep standing. It might be get, what, once? You know, they, they refer to the plural, you know, stand-ups, multiple stand-ups, none of that. No, 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 one. In 25 minutes. In 25 minutes, yeah. one. Which um, led to the best 30 seconds of the fight, if I remember right. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and again, it was very exciting, that yeah. exchange they had. And again, people are like, you know, but that's, look, look in boxing. MMA is not boxing before people start losing their shit on mind. You know, the facet of, of MMA, uh, sorry, in boxing, obviously you're left. We have to let people work in there. People thought it's wrestling there. Do you know how long you get in wrestling for a referee's on his whistle? Three seconds, if you're lucky. You know, and we can't expect a fighter to do that. Mm. And we do give consideration and respect of a game plan in terms of not what I think is going to happen in the later rounds, but I can't expect a fighter to sprint because that's impossible. They have to, you know, there's ebb and flow. There's peak and trough in a fight. You sprint, recover, get your breath, get your position, etc., etc. And we're monitoring that as the round goes on. But essentially, I'm looking for two things. One is action or progress kind of one's inherent to the other. If you're trying to pass to a more dominant position, now you can stay in a particular 
if I stayed in, in, in a closed guard, if I'm actively working, you can beat somebody up from a closed guard. And the guy from the bottom could potentially beat someone up from a closed guard. If he breaks the posture, pulls them down, mm. elbows, punches. Kenny Florian, Sean Shirk. Yeah, and, and it look at uh, Brian Ortega is a good example of what you yeah. can do off your back, how throwing up submissions. I'm, I'm not going to say a word. Mm. You know, but it's like the action and progress. We, you, we're looking for willful, meaningful intent. If somebody's going to stay in that position, you know, whether it be standing or whether it be on the ground, willful, meaningful intent. Intent on what, either trying to get to a better position or they're happy to stay in that position if they're damaging their opponent or effectively striking, should we say. And, and damage is a training word we use. Uh, but, you know, if I'm being effective in that position and it's like, like I said, it's like, you know, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. People will criticise referees for sometimes watching a fight. They get caught watching and they don't realise, hang on, the fight's slowed down a little bit. Sometimes it is our duty and responsibility to, to move it along and, you know, remind the guys. And people will, will also know that it's something that I want, it's an important point to stress is, and I say to every fighter in the, in the pre-fight meeting, and you'll hear me do the same in, I will never, never take a position away without prior warning, twice, minimum of twice. So I always say to the fighters, look, if I want you to do something, excuse me, if I want you to do something, I'm going to tell you. Um, and I'll do it once, time elapse, twice, time elapse, sometimes three times, That, that then I'll choose to separate. I'll never just come in and go, stop. And the guys, like, why? I'll always, you know, give them that, warning if you like or give them that announcement that i'm looking for them to advance but what do they want us to do you know if a fighter hypothetically took somebody down in a closed guard and lay on top of him what you expect is not to do anything that you don't want us to stand them up you don't you know like i said hypothetical highly unlikely it happens but some you'll get fighters who can catch a break you know and you have to allow them to catch that but like i said it's not a sprint it's unfair to expect fighters to have maximum output for 25 minutes or 15 minutes. That's unrealistic. But there does come a point in certain fights where it's clear that the guy on the bottom doesn't want to get up, but the guy on the top may not want to advance either. Mm -hmm. And I'm not giving, I'm not saying that's the particular case. For, I'm talking about any fight. It's my job to interject at that point and mm. say you know and I, I listened to <laughs> I listened to Brendan Schaub's <clears throat> first uh, video when uh, you know he went to town of course he did yeah, said he what did he, a, he did a big brown breakdown all over you yeah said what he wanted to say and then oh. about you know my job is do I know what I'm doing Brendan trust me I know what I'm doing um, whether you agree or disagree um Second, like, you know, stop me dying. It's a little bit dramatic, a little bit silly because I don't want anyone to die and it's not my job to stop you dying. My job is to make sure you fight within the rules and not stop taking punishment. So I understand what you're trying to say, but, you know, I don't want anyone to die in, in a ring. It's not a good connotation. It's not good wording to use no. when it comes to fights. Um, you know, and w when I'm there to... Uh, interject for somebody like I said it's 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 in the interest of having the fight naturally progress and sometimes in fights you know that just doesn't happen I just don't get it Dan so what so here's, here's a question for you then because there was a point where and this was what maybe 15 years ago or something there was a point where people started to realize that if they score a takedown at the end of the round they probably might, they might steal that on the judges scorecards now it seems to me that there are a lot of fighters that know that if they work their way into a clinch to tie their opponents up and wear them out it's easier to let the referee separate them than to find that break themselves to progress so oftentimes i feel like fighters will initiate a clinch as a part of their game plan and then work in the clinch until the referee separates them. And I did get that feeling from Kamara and something else that's not been spoken about as well is when you separated them, every time you separated them, Woodley turned and he walked away with his back facing mm. and you turned and you said, hey, turn around and face and fight. Yeah. He was checking the clock. He was already tired. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it was almost like Kamara's game plan was working and you'd done Kamara a favor by separating them because then he can put it back on Woodley and Woodley was already tired. Yeah. So it was like there's, there's this whole skewed perspective of what it is. And 
I would struggle to, I, I, I wouldn't be able to referee. I, I really don't think I would because I wouldn't be able to look at it objectively. I get frustrated with people. Whereas you're able to take that frustration and leave it outside the octagon when you referee, which is... Sometimes. Well, yeah, but you do. That's one of the reasons why you, you, you're so good at what you do. But there's a, there's a lot of onus on the commentators respecting the referee and respecting the referee's decision. It's very rare that in a, in a commentary position, in a commentary role, I will say something against the referee. Unless I think it's blatantly obvious, and the one I'm going to use, and I'm sorry, Herb, it's the CB Dolloway fight. In that fight, CB was in three prone positions, curled up one side, curled up the other, and then flattened out. He's not going to tap because he's too proud and he's too tough. But that's the circumstance where Herb should... I felt kind of like he was watching the fight instead of refereeing it in that moment. Mm -hmm. And in that circumstance, I did say, this fight needs to be stopped. This fight's out. Uh, this, this, this fight is done. He's given up. What responsibility, as a general UFC referee, as a general MMA referee to a general MMA commentator, what would you say, advise, ask of commentators when it comes to commentating and, and referring to referees in fights? Because that's really the big problem in this one. Like I said, um, if, if, we'd have, if we'd have, I've started saying, like I say, like you. If we, if, if listen, you, <laughs> listen, if we, if, if you'd have not seen any of the social interactions, the, 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 the Twitter stuff, the commentators saying whatever they did, it would have been another fight that you refereed and you'd have moved on and we'd have been at Cage Warriors this week and it would have just been another event. So a lot of the backlash was most likely initiated or at least encouraged by the way that the commentators commentate. And I'm a commentator, I know. Can I, I just stop you there? Yeah, yeah. Entirely. Entirely. There influenced by the commentator's words. Yep. 99.9% .9 .9 of the backlash was a direct result of what the commentators said. That's a fact. So so what responsibility do we have as commentators then to the referees to make sure that we're not you know, causing I'm not, those issues? I don't think you owe us any responsibility, mate. I, I, I don't. Um, See, I feel like my responsibility is to the sport. I get that, mate. And here's the thing. It's like with you. No, no, maybe if Adam Catterall's this, he's going to hate this part. <laughs> so we're back to the Mark and Dan Appreciation Club. People don't know that when you first got the job, when you moved into commentary, it really caught, caught me off guard because I, I I never thought for one second, I didn't have you pegged as a commentator. No idea. Neither did I. <laughs> yeah, but there you go. But two things, two things that stick in my mind. The first is when you became a commentator, you, you called me and you said, Mark, when's your next referee and judge course? And I was like, why? And then you told me. I was like, fucking hell, amazing. And he goes, I want to know what I'm talking about or be in a better position to understand. You wanted to see it from our, A, you wanted to understand the actual, the hard and fast things, the rules, the black and white, the A and B, the do and don't, you know? You wanted to understand that. That's why I have so much respect for you. And it's not just about, you know, I mean, I, I think you're the best in the game by a country mile. And this is not me decrying other commentators. You'll get colours, you'll get play-by-plays, etc., etc. Maybe unfairly influenced the fact that I, you do carry a big responsibility, massive. I don't think it's a separate responsibility as the officials because we're not. Uh, yeah, we're important to the, to the, the, to the momentum and movement of a fight. But I don't think you owe me anything personally. But you owe the sport, like you said, you owe the sport. And you put yourself in the best possible position. You armed yourself with a whole batch of new info that you didn't. Because when you came on that course, it's like, like I said, Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan has metaphorically, well, actually, he's got the biggest mouth in this sport mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, he's been there forever. Very well-known commentator. He's, he's listened to by millions of people. Um, uh, to my knowledge... I don't think Joe has ever attended, you know, not mine, but Herb or John. I don't think he's ever attended a a a, a, a referee and judge seminar or, or school. And if he's wrong, then I stand corrected. Won't be the first time I stand corrected. But to my knowledge, he hasn't done that. Um, and and I just thought, like, you know, I'm thinking of you that you done that, and he's so influential. He could impart so much info onto the. Like I said. I said about people, this is still a new sport. You know, we are, we're, we're a new yeah. sport. And when you look at our closest relative is boxing. And when you look at, obviously, you know, boxing, Marcus of Queensby, 100 and whatever years old, established, everything. MMA, we're still a far way away from that. I'm working so hard behind the scenes as well with the IMAF and 
doing seminars for referees and judges, trying to get everybody onto this, not to be robots. Mm. I'm going to do that as well, the, the IMAF one. Yeah, I'd love you to, because it's a yeah. week, whole weekend. Yeah. But Joe's like the voice and the platform he has, you know, like I said, the metaphoric big man. I mean, I mean metaphorically, obviously, because of his demographic and his reach, if he, it's like when Big John went on to, a uh, Big John went on um, Joe's podcast, I was like, yes, he's going to do that. And then the conversation didn't go that way. It kind of went more on the history of the sport. And jo John's an OG, the originator, you know, my man. And I love the guy. And, uh, but I think we missed an opportunity. I say we collectively we missed an opportunity, but that's just the way the conversation went. And like I said, whether Joe, choose, I've reached out to him a few times, not, not to go on the podcast. <laughs> I'm not, important I'm, I'm not it's not you know i'm not important enough i'm not, I'm not asking you i've said to him come and meet me for a coffee let's sit down give me 30 minutes and i guarantee you i'll change your obviously on the judging perspective as one because that's the most um it's more it's, speculative it's the most speculative it's the yeah. most dissected most yeah. misunderstood Definitely. i said joe come come and meet me let, let me buy you a coffee let's sit down have a beer after the show and i'll talk to you give me 30 minutes of your time an hour of your time i promise i'll let i'll let you think differently you may not want to use what i say you may not but you know just things like that because i have that responsibility you've just told me yourself you see it as a responsibility. And like I said, it's not me you owe. It's not the officials. It's the sport, mm. you know. Thanks for saying you owe me. But you, it's not me you owe or any other referee. It's the sport. And like I said, the people need to understand that. Just how, you know, to me it was so warming and, and, and so analytical what you did when, when you armed yourself with that info. John Gooden done the same thing, you know. John has came on, it was like a one-day thing and... They're a bit more developed and in depth now. John done the same thing to arm himself with the info. Josh Palmer's done the same thing. Josh is doing really well on the on the commentary. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's like I said, um, from a responsibility point of view, it's subjective and it's personal. You either want to learn or, or or you don't. Yeah, but it, it's like because it is such a because it is such a specific job. It's a, such a specific role to play as a, as an MMA referee. I, I as a commentator, especially when I came and did your uh, did, did your, your refereeing and judging course, because I mean I, I had what thirty some fights. I still learned there was a bunch of stuff in that that I didn't I didn't know. That I'm looking back now and thinking I I could have used more in my fights if I you know like striking areas on the head for example, yeah. and so those kind of things. But I still get confused. Like I messaged you after the John Jones knee the other week against uh, Anthony Smith, yeah. and in my mind I'm like, well that that was a fight that was a legal knee. But then you pointed out to me that it was Nevada, which is not up to the new rules. And Correct. California, where John fought fairly recently, was the new set of rules. Correct. Where he, that would have been a legal name. Correct. Just so happens that it was in a different state and the rule is implemented differently. Yeah. And it was illegal in, in Nevada. But that, that still is illegal in Nevada. See, th th there are those kind of things. It, I mean, I, it's, it's the stay in your lane thing, isn't it? It's the stay in your lane thing. I'm a commentator. So I have to respect you as a referee or whoever is in there as a referee until I see them do something that I think is blatantly out of line or um, short-sighted in the way that they're refereeing. Otherwise, I'm going to defer to you as the expert in that role. Does that make sense? Yeah. So a part of my responsibility is to go, I'm not a referee. You're the referee and I trust you to make those good decisions. Now, unfortunately, there are a couple of referees in the sport that I'm, as soon as I see their name on the card, I'm like, ah. Oh. I feel there's a question in me, but I still have to err on the side of trust and go, well, they are the referee, I'm the commentator, so I'm going to do my job and I'm going to let them do theirs. And you'll speak it as you find. As I find, If yeah. something happens, you're going, sure. to, you're going to say it. Yeah, absolutely. But at, at the same time, I, I, I think that, like, the comment that Dominic Cruz made, and I, I as, you, as you said, I'm, I'm a big fan of Dominic Cruz's knowledge, his information, not necessarily of his, of his, of his commentary style, um, I think he's, well, <laughs> Owen Oxley called him the mood hoover. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I, I use that term. It's a good one, yeah. I, I've used that in the past. I use the mood hoover. Not, not for the comp. I'm just saying that it's, uh, I've used that to describe certain people in the past. Yeah. He's just, the, the tone in which he commentates is very, it's very flippant a lot of the time, I find. And I don't know whether that's, I, I don't think he's that person particularly. I interviewed him in Vegas uh, for, 
somebody BBC or BT I, d- or I don't know Dominic no I don't know him as a person I don't know him as an individual he's a, he's a very sharp mind it's, it's just it's the way he speaks sometimes like I asked him a question I'm, I'm interviewing him as a as an as an interviewer interviewing an analyst yeah and I said to him so it was 229 and I said so tell me about this fight tell me about how you expect Tony Ferguson and and and, uh, and Pettis to play out on the feet and his response to me was you know that like you know these answers it's it's almost like it's a bit, it's 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 quite abrasive in the way that he speaks. Yeah. Um, and I, f- I so, felt sorry, like well, sorry. I just I felt like that was that comment was it was unnecessary and it was abrasive. But I, I think it's it's the it's the tone that Dominic Cruz presents in sometimes. Yeah. It's I mean sometimes it's very beige and I really struggle to listen to his commentary not because of the the technical analysis because of the tone. I mean you never see you never hear Dominic Cruz's voice on one of the the highlight reels of someone getting knocked out, it's usually like me or Anik or Rogan going, oh, You're oh. in the moment. Yeah, because in that moment where we're screaming and jumping out of our chair, you've got Dominic Cruz going, well, you're going to get punched in the face if you drop your hands. You know what I mean? And the whole <laughs> arena's going up and he's just like, well, that's what's going to happen if you put your head there. Very matter of fact. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I struggle with that kind of commentary, which is why I think they often put him in a two-man booth with Joe because they've got someone to, to add a bit Add another colour other than beige to the commentary. Let's put it a that way. Bit of spice. Yeah, he does. I mean, Joe's like look, and he's been with exchange. Like he he uh, on that particular fight, he didn't say anything. You know, he well, he you just say what he said. He didn't he didn't say anything derogatory or disrespectful to me. He was asking questions about. I don't know why he'd say that. You know, I I know he didn't say anything derogatory or disrespectful. That that's I didn't say that at all. You know, and if you watch the the exchange he had with when uh, Brendan Sharp and him was doing uh, Joe's podcast, and he is like, <laughs> and Brendan Sharp was there, he called you out, and t- he's like, uh, me? He said, what did I say? And then they brought it up, and he's gone, well, no, he didn't call you out directly. He was reading it, and he said, I think Brendan Sharp said at the end, and then uh, oh, well, fuck Joe Rogan up. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, he's going, no, he didn't say that. And Joe was saying, look, you know, he gave his opinion, and and I know that's what he's doing. But I just wish that, like I said, he is the most powerful voice in this sport. He really is. Mm. And uh, like I said, I don't know, is it in his interest, dude? Does he want to? Of course, it's it, it's his choice. You know, he, he has been complimentary of me. He has been nice to me in the past. And that's not what I'm looking for. You know, it's not. It's nice if he does that. But because I, I, I don't give him, re- I don't want to give him reason to, you know, uh, question me like if you called me out or you said something you I, I know a in the way we should do it and b uh, whether we agreed or disagreed we'd never fall out mm. we're doing that never i've said to you dan what's your honest take and if you came back to me and said abc or xyz okay cool but no, no problem because it's okay to disagree mm-hmm. what it's not okay to do is abuse an individual that's never okay because then we're gonna have a fight <laughs> and how many Dominic Cruises would we need in order to make it a fair fight against you? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> He'd have to tag in Brendan Sharp just to make it fair. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Okay. I think we need to draw a line under it now. I and I don't. I don't think you should have apologised. And I don't think there was anything to apologise for regarding the the comment that you made to Usman either, because people are only seeing one side I of it. I just didn't want to be misunderstood. No, of course. No, I get You know, that. and like I said, with a, I've listened to the other people, some other personalities in the sport and they call me arrogant, they call me this, that. You know, I, sorry, I can't do anything about that, but that's not who I am. You don't know me. You don't know my character. Character, you know, like I said, re- character reputation is a hugely distinguishing difference because a reputation is what people think you are, but a character you know, is who you really are. And that's what's important to me because I can't control reputation, but I can control character because mm. that's based on interactions I may have with a certain individual. But yeah, look, I've, I've, I've done it to death now. People are probably like, yes, he is. So a lot of people, yeah, you are going to get your wish. You're not going to hear off me for a long time. And the people that, you know, like I said, it's that thing. I've just proved it, you know, People are on about referees should be held accountable. Why don't you explain yourself? Why don't you come on? A, and obviously we get in trouble for this a lot. And my bosses are probably breathing a huge sigh of relief too. And obviously, you know, at, at the UFC, but naming no names, the most influential, uh, most influential man in my career as an official, who I love dearly and means the world to me. You know, he, he, whose advice I will always take on board. 
Um, that's the important part that I need to take now. So a lot of people have got their wish in as much as, because if I do speak and I do try and give that, then I'm, I want the camera or I want this or I want that. I just, I don't know what people want. So it's best just to slide yeah. away. Yeah. So the earth's flat. <laughs> is it know? fuck? <laughs> It is. Is it know. fuck? <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> yeah, so the MMA stuff's out the way. Yeah, we're done with that now. Let's finish on. The flat. We can finish on, you know, the, 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 the Earth's flat. No, it fucking isn't. <laughs> it is. It's, it's got a dome over it, you know. I ha I told you, you said we had one. There was one person who I knew, a good friend of mine, got a lovely guy, great guy. And if he listens to, so, some will recognize who I'm talking about. I think it's unfair to name him, but he said the same thing. And I'm like, you know me, the most pragmatic mind in the world, A to B, black is white, da 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 da, stop. <laughs> I'm like, what? I said, he explained to me, I said, get on a plane. He, I said, you believe in air travel, right? He said, yeah. I said, so you go up in the sky, all of that's real. He said, yeah. I said, you fly to America? Yeah. So you're flying west? Yeah. I said, now get back on the fucking same plane. Yeah. I said, now keep flying west. <laughs> yeah. What happens? What? If it's not round, what, <laughs> what, 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 at which point do I get to end? He's like, well, it just, it, and I'm like, what do you mean, what, curls? And he's going, no, no, I said, so explain, what, what time do I drop off? He said, no, you just keep flying over ocean. I don't know, you don't get it. If I keep flying over ocean, where's the end? Where does, and he couldn't answer. And I said, well, what about space? He went, no, it's, there is no such thing. And I'm like, he said, there's a glass dome. Mm. And I'm like, <laughs> how big's the fucking glass? <laughs> how big is the glass? <laughs> it's a giant contact lens. It's a giant yeah. contact lens. And Sponsored I'm like, by you know, I respect everybody's say that. But at a certain point, you've got to remind people, look, it's not an opinion. You're fucking out there. <laughs> You're the one in space, mate. You are out there. <laughs> Well, I, the thing is, it, it's, it's coming up the so earth much. Is flat. <laughs> but it's coming up so much. And a friend of mine, someone I respect greatly in many, many ways, <laughs> believes the earth's flat, genuinely. And and I brought it up and we had a conversation. And I will I will have a podcast. Did you him. ask him about the what happens if you keep yeah. flying? It's Game of Thrones. It's a wall of ice all the way around. It's but a when do ice. I hit the wall? I don't when you fly into it, I guess. That's what I'm saying. How far does it fucking go? Well, the pilots know not to go that way because there's a wall of ice. Oh. And if they don't hit the wall of ice, then they're going to fly over the ice until they hit the glass dome. Yeah, and I said to him, I said, so, I said, if I leave, like, LA, if I leave the west coast of America mm -hmm. and fly to Australia, for mm -hmm. instance, I said, obviously, I go, you agree that I'll go west and I'm flying over water. He's like, yeah, I'm going... But if it wasn't a sphere, how the fuck can I do that? How can I, I don't fly back over Europe and Africa and Asia to get to Australia. I have to fly round. Mm. But they can't, they can't, I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's a weird, like, there's, there's, a, there's a mistrust in society, and that's where these conspiracies come from. I mean, that, that's, that's a... Oh, well, that's a nice way of saying it. That, that to me feels like someone that believed in Santa or the Easter Bunny until they were like sort of 14 or 15. And they showed up at school and everyone was like, everyone that year found out that it wasn't true and they were the last person to find out. And they got to school and everyone was like, Easter Bunny? That was last year. That's not real. And they're like, that's it. I'm not believing anything. Paul I McCartney? Can't see. <laughs> I can't see. Move your hand. Ah. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> but the real Paul McCartney's dead. That's you don't believe that. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know. Look into it, Eddie Bravo. Look into it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Mate. I'm, you know what? I'm I'm probably the wrong person. To, you you want a camera to follow me around? I was telling people last night about like my interactions like with Starbucks and stuff. Uh, yeah, it's uh, how much I lose it in just a simple thing. <laughs> we spoke last week about the my, my, misophobia. Misophobia. Yeah. Yeah. Misophonia. Sorry. We spoke about that, but yeah, no Earth. I, I would like to have a debate with the flat earthers. Because like I said, I'm probably their worst with chalk and cheese because I am the prank. Like, sh I want you to show me. Get, get a pen. Draw what happens so <laughs> I'll understand. Fucking draw. When do I hit the wall? Where's the wall? Is it glass? Is it I Where is it? Yeah. And tell me how I go this way. How do I fly over ocean and reach Australia if we're not a sphere? Tell me how. I I'll have to buy one of the disc dome things that you, they, they make disc atlases now have you seen them what it's, it's a disc atlas 
like a like a like a like a globe, but mm -hmm. obviously we're not gonna have a globe. Yeah. So it's probably easier to make as well a disc. It's a disc with all the all the countries drawn on it, and then a glass dome over the top. I mean, that is not not believable. I like I like the conversations in a. That is believable for a two D image, <laughs> right? But they go back again to like you, I know you get it, and I know you're not a flat earther. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> 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 you're, not, you're not a flat earther. I've I've been up the mast on a boat in uh, on on the equator. You right? saw the curve. You can see the curve of the Earth. Like I'm I'm literally I'm a hundred feet off the off the off the the deck of the boat, and in every direction, it's like looking through a fisheye lens. You can see the Earth yeah. dropping away in every direction, especially on the ocean. Yeah, because it's so. And flat. the other thing as well is like when you're like you can see <laughs> not so curved. <laughs> 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 like you can see. <laughs> Shit. You can see stuff coming out of the ocean. Like you can see like like massive cargo ships and you can see the top of the ship and then you just see it rise out of the ocean. Hmm. And I think that the 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 horizon sort of like 200 miles. I think it's about 200 for miles human for sight. human the human eye. Um but like Is that how far the human I eye can see? Yeah, like 200 miles. Whoa. W without obstruction obviously. Of course, yeah. But one of the arguments that this there was um there's a documentary on Netflix, Behind the Curve, Behind, Beyond the Curve, Behind the Curve. I couldn't watch it. I know, I'll turn it off Something after five about minutes. Curve. Well, there's this guy who just happens to live in his mom's basement. Not that that's got anything to do with anything. He probably tweeted at you after the Woodley Usman fight. Possibly. No <laughs> um, I wonder how many people that tweet me abuse are flat earth believers. Oh, I, I, I'd say at least 50%. <laughs> probably more. Probably more. Um... <laughs> He was talking about how he's standing on, I can't remember where he lives. It's an island in, in Washington state and he can see Seattle. Mm -hmm. And his argument is that if the earth wasn't flat, that, that, that Seattle would be behind the curve, even though it's about you know, 40 miles away. Oh, like, I, think he, I think he thinks that, that the earth's like a tennis ball kind of size. I, I don't know. What? I don't know. I don't know. I don't well, know. what shape's a tennis ball? I, I can't. It's flat. It's yeah. a flat tennis ball, of course. It's a disc. It's a oh. frisbee. We live on a frisbee. Yeah, I'll tell you what you want to do. We'll make a deal. I'll watch the doc. You film me watching the documentary. There you go. Film me <laughs> watching the documentary. We'll, we'll, do a, we'll do a doco companion. I just think that flat earthers, they're just mad troll jobs, aren't they? They're just I laughing. I think some of them the are. Side, secret side going, look, look how I rate these silly fuckers. How easy is it to wind someone up? Yeah. I know. We'll tell them the earth's flat. I, Eddie Bravo, I reckon, is a massive troll. I reckon. I don't Eddie think doesn't believe the earth's flat, does he? No, but he's always talking about it. I don't think he believes it is. Yeah, but yeah, he'll, yeah. he'll pose as a flat earther. But like, so you watch this documentary, and you've got this guy who lives in this town, who's like, he's, he's something to do with law enforcement and judgment, and it's like the like the ju like the judging system, the legal system, and he's got a, a respectable job in this town, but he also runs the flat earth community. And these people got together, and there's, there's this footage of them in a room arguing about whether it's a dome or a box or whether it's infinite. They all agree that the Earth's flat. They just don't know what's above it. Fucking and, idiots. And then, and then they were talking about how what they think is basically... So imagine you... So the Earth's... We've got a flat disk Earth, which is surrounded by a wall of ice. And then outside of that, there are just loads more of those. So it's like a continuous sheet of bubble wrap. Okay, with a, with a I can't. Do, I can't. No. Nah. I'd storm out. <laughs> I think I'd storm out. I wouldn't be able to. I couldn't because my. Yeah, I'm joking about stuff, but yeah, look. You're not much of a conspiracy theory guy, then. No. Little bits. But yeah. This sounds. Maybe this is a contradiction. I'm a. I'm a believer in believable conspiracies. Okay. Not, you know, things that have actually happened. We've saw events happen. You think no, there's more than that. Than, there's more to that than mm -hmm. meets the eye. Yeah. But the whole. Yeah, I'm not, I don't sit at home wearing a Tim Fall hat. No, no way, <laughs> no way. The the real Paul McCartney's Dead is a good documentary. It's worth watching because I love the Beatles. I love the Beatles, and I had this conversation with Frank and Jennifer Mia, and they love the Beatles as well. And I'm like, well, who started that? I don't know. Well, so the 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 the, the, the rumor is that George Harrison sent a bunch of tapes to a studio in Hollywood before he died, mm -hmm. talking about how. The real Paul McCartney died during the recording of one of their earlier albums. I can't remember exactly which one now. And since then, the Beatles, the three remaining Beatles, and the imposter Paul McCartney, who was found in a lookalike contest that was run in the US, had facial reconstruction <laughs> to change the <laughs> had facial reconstruction to change the shape of his face. Um, had speech uh, therapy to you know give him a British accent instead of an American accent. 
Uh, oh, so the, the, oh, the fake one's American? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, my they days. They also taught him how to play the guitar with the left hand instead of the right hand because Paul McCartney's left-handed. So he has to play the guitar the opposite way around as well. <sighs> you think you're off to with it. Why don't you find a left-handed guitarist who's British? Save yourself the fucking work. Gotta look like Paul McCartney. They ran a Paul McCartney lookalike contest in the US. This is one of the one of the bits of evidence to back it up. <laughs> and and then they were saying, <laughs> and then they were saying that all the way through that like the the, the, the following albums that the three remaining Beatles were trying to communicate that the real Paul McCartney had actually died. So like Rubber Soul, like apparently John Lennon's nickname for the fake Paul McCartney was Rubber Paul. So they called that Rubber Soul as a way of uh, let it, the Let It Be album. Paul McCartney is the only one that's on a red background and is the only one looking in a different direction to the rest of the, the band. The front cover of the Sgt. Pepper's uh, album shows the old Beatles with the original Paul McCartney and then the new Beatles with the fake Paul McCartney and they've got his, his guitar in the bottom in flowers like it's his funeral and... I mean, there there is literally loads and loads <laughs> of evidence it. to it. It's mad. Oh, and I watched it and I'm like, like it, f for, for about 15 minutes it broke me. Is it, this, is it the same group that said Elvis is still alive? Oh, no that doubt. No. Oh, wait, maybe Elvis is the guy that, that filled in for Paul McCartney. Oh, I could see that. There's oh, a new, that, that's our own conspiracy theory. We'll start that one. It, it's worth a watch though. It is worth a watch. But then I got to thinking if the real Paul McCartney died in his early 20s, <laughs> If this is true, let's just say this is true. If the real Paul McCartney died in his, in his early 20s in a car accident, mm -hmm. which is when he met Linda McCartney, by the way. Okay. Because they were both in the same car when they had the accident and Paul died and she lost a leg. Ah. That's a part of the conspiracy. I didn't know they were well. in the same accident. No, well, they, they weren't, but that's a part of the conspiracy. Uh, right, okay. It was raining. He picked her up, gave her a lift because she was caught in the rain. She realized it was Paul McCartney. He starts freaking out. He crashes the car in the rain. That's the theory. And the uh, um, MI5 at the time came to the Beatles and was like, look, we can't tell anybody that Paul McCartney's dead because we'll have a rash of suicides around the world. So that's why they faked it, to protect their own fan base. That's the theory. <laughs> 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 it's, it's worth a watch. It's worth a watch. But then I got to thinking, so if the real Paul McCartney died at, what, in his early 20s and the Paul McCartney that we've got now, who's the imposter, has been Paul McCartney since... He's mm. actually been Paul McCartney longer than the original Paul McCartney. Okay. So that's how I got acceptance of it. Because, I, I, it, I, you know, it confused me for a little while. And I so had do you, do and you I believe that? No, I don't now. I don't now. But, it, it's, but it, you did at one point? At one point, I was questioning, yeah. I'm going to hit absolutely. him with the mic. <laughs> <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to watch the documentary. We, we, we've got to watch the documentary. The real Paul McCartney. That, that could dead. be a new thing. Filming Goddard watches. or <laughs> Like filming going into Starbucks. I was explaining to the guys last night. So what night. happened at Starbucks then? Oh, I, don't, just, I don't shop at it's Starbucks. It's just a weird though. shit, mate. It's Ever like, since you I know, found out Dr. Evil owns it, I don't, I don't shop there anymore. The what? Dr. Evil owns it out of Austin Powers okay you haven't watched Austin Powers I have right right so in was it the first or second movie when they brought Austin Powers it was the second movie when they brought him back from cryostasis right they brought him back and they'd built an empire and it, it was Starbucks they bought Starbucks and put all their money into that see now we've got movie references that he doesn't get <laughs> and I'm not the one sitting there looking confused <laughs> you know taking whoa, the whoa, piss whoa, out whoa, of whoa. me but the Warren Bob was <laughs> fucking sick <laughs> I've had so many tweets. I need to watch the movie again. I've had so many tweets. Uh, yeah, you it. saw that film though. I, a long time was, ago. Mate, a long time was, ago. I had so many tweets going, uh, what made me laugh is, Goddard's laughing. <laughs> <laughs> again, Goddard's laughing. Goddard's smiling. I'm like, But that kind of ties in back to what I said before about trying to get semi-serious again is because most people's interaction of or recollection or first view of me is when I'm in a controlled environment. You know, teacher, can't almost like a, a school teacher. I'm, I'm paid to be, it is an uh, authoritative role mm -hmm. that you're there to do. So I'm not going to be, sort of, I've started laughing and smiling in fights. Can you imagine that? Can't and, have a good time in there. Yeah, no, the internet really <laughs> would implode. But <laughs> so, yeah, Do Dr. Evil owns Starbucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in the movies. Okay. All the evidence is there. <laughs> Documentaries about Austin Powers, they're, they're in there. Um, London next week, UFC yeah, London. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, excited for it? V can't wait. Like Special I said, arena into Oto the, Arena. Reset and yeah. um obviously last night was awesome. Had a great time last night. It was you a know, good venue. Good venue. Good had a, the O2 is my favourite venue in the world. Is that right? Hundred percent. Over in all the all the places in Vegas. I mean, where's your close second? Where's your close second? Uh, Rio. Obviously look, here's the here's the weird thing. It's obvious well fuck. 
Now you got me conspiring myself. <laughs> you gonna obviously look lo- into it. I think London is the one of the best, if not the best arena in the world. I think it's phenomenal. I think there's a fact that the O2 in London is the most booked out arena in the world. Is that right? Yeah, fact because of all the music artists and obviously we we rule the we rule the roost when it comes to music, right? No, not America, the, the UK. Of Beatles, Zeppelin, so everybody Floyd, wants I mean. to come to, to, but I think it is the most requested or booked out in advance arena in the world. Look into it. Really? Um, <laughs> yeah, Rio is, is, I mean, Las Vegas is super special. When you go into the MGM Grand, better because of, mainly because of you know what's happened there in mm. the you know with boxing and obviously with their MMA is steeped in history now. Yeah, I mean, it's, I fought there. There you, go. there you go. Steeped in history. Steeped. I'm steeped in history. And I, I remember the first time you are. <laughs> I remember the first time I went in. I had like a little moment, you know, a little quiet moment when I first went into the MGM. And now I'm looking round and like envisaging, obviously, and remembering, giving thanks and you know, a bit of credence to where I was. Mm. It is like a it's a hallow ground in terms of fighting and combat sports. When you see the the greats mm. that have you know, especially with boxing. Because when sure. you walk down that corridor, it's like a hall of fame, and you see the the, the best boxers of of all time have, have performed in that arena. Yeah. Some of the most magical moments for the UFC. Rio is very special. It's one of my favorite, if not my favorite, destination because it's the whole thing there. You know, mm. it's very very special. I love obviously the UK. Scotland was monumentally oh, that was wild. Glasgow. Monumentally close to me. Mm. Um, it's weird because. I was refing in Vegas the week before, man. I was talking to Ariel, and it was like a, it's a big Twitter debate. There's a Twitter debate, and he was like, very special moment for Mark. And then they're like, what are you talking about? He's English. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not English. I was born in Scotland. Trying to say to people, hello, Alan Love. Like, trying to say to people, you know, I was born in Scotland. And he's like, no, I've, I've heard him speak. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I've heard him speak, and then I said, obviously, now I moved to. I was very young when I moved to England, um, and I grew up here and went to school here. You know, that's why I adopted a, a, an English accent. But um, Scotland was. If you look, the first fight I did done in Scotland was it was the Rob Whiteford fight. He fought Paul Redmond, mm. and he came out, and obviously he came out to um, Scotland the Brave. And it was like I was crying. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. But I had to obviously I had to hide it, you yeah. know. No, in terms of I just felt you know very proud, obviously of you know being in Scotland, and obviously listening to the you know the bagpipes. It's stirring. Mm. There's it's something about like, bagpipes. I know I it's get a the call same to feeling. arms, man. That's exactly what it is. There's something very very primal in about it. I, when I hear it's bagpipes, deeply emotive. Do, yeah. And it, it, yeah. I was like, you know, choking it back as it were. Mm. And then I'm into, you know, I'm there to be a referee, obviously, and in part, nothing to do with it, a Scotsman fighting. It was the fact that it had been in Scotland, that was a special time. In Japan, obviously, Saitama Super Arena. Yeah, I always wanted to fight there. How can you not? And obviously the fight I had there was just fucking off the charts. Which one was that then? The, I've been there a couple of times, but the one is uh, Brian Stan and Vanderlei Silva. Oh, wow. <laughs> And it was obviously that's Vandalay's spiritual home. Yeah, because he's revered the axe it, murderer. That's where it, he got in Japan. Right? It's where everybody got to know him. That was ultra special. Hang on. <laughs> that was that was that was uh, the, the Raptors are looking at us like, what the fuck yeah. is Dan doing? You remember that, don't you, Vandalay Silver? They don't get the, that. The ref- the Do you get the reference? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. I used Raptors. To love that. <laughs> um, yeah, We're bringing the, them up to speed. We've got them on fight pass. We're bringing them up. But to doing speed. doing shows in the UK is always special. Yeah. But the, I think this is the be- on paper. I think this is the best card, close to the best card we've had mm. uh, in the Uk Obviously, we've had some. We've had superstars before, yeah. and obviously, Bisping when, Silver was wild. When you fought, you fought in the UK several times. Michael Bisping fought in the UK, defended his belt. Never beaten in the UK, Michael. Right? No, he never lost. Mm. Yeah, he never lost. He fought, you'll start the conspiracies. Home cooking. <laughs> Fucking judges. Home <laughs> cooking. Um, yeah, you've refereed me 14 times. I've never lost, though. Yeah, 14 I know. 14 times? I know. Never and here lost. we are doing a podcast. Well, was doing a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> doing a podcast. He never lost, yeah. But um, every bit of standouts are Las Vegas for sure. Uh, I haven't worked in New York yet, but I 
I'm not licensed in New York yet. Whether I am or not in the future, I don't know. Obviously, Madison Square Gardens, again, is steeped mm. in history, even further back than the MGM, obviously. Um, Japan, Australia, China, all the places. But, yeah, probably my, probably my favourite destination on Earth is Rio. Mm. Very it's just cool. it's magical. Man. You've been right. I, I've been to Rio, but not for MMA. I, I sailed there. I sailed. I, I did the Clipper, ah, the Clipper race from uh, from the UK. So by the time I got there, I've been at sea for nearly thirty days and looked like Jack Sparrow. My beard was all out and I, like sunburnt, suntan. I looked like a leather handbag. I was. I looked pretty rough when I arrived. I looked al almost. In fact, how long were you at sea for? Twenty eight days. Twenty eight. Twenty nine days. Wow. Yeah. I, I looked pretty beat up when I when I arrived, but then I was there for a couple of days, and I called over to see uh, Aldo at Nova and Yao, and just spent a couple of days training with them. It was awesome, awesome. Watching you know Hacker and Diaz sparring with Johnny Eduardo, and it was a it was a it's a great little gym. Mate, I mean, they the, beat the, the hell out of each other, but great space. I Rio like is unbelievable. It's like yeah. you know people talk about the spirituality and the essence, and like you know the energy you'll get from the standing on the beach and the sea. There, there's something very because obviously like or loathe it's kind of regarded as the obviously japan are going to say no usa but the spiritual it's home of valley the mm -hmm. spiritual home of mma for for want of a better description yeah. and like i said you know that crowd i've ref and when you refer people go you get intimidated you pander to the crowd shut the fuck up <laughs> a pander to a crowd <laughs> when you've refereed you know, Vandalay in Japan, one of refereed Anderson Silver in Brazil, um, uh, Jose Aldo in Brazil, uh, talked to me about intimidation. Mm. You know, I'm paid not to be intimidated. Yeah. But the, the fight that stands out for me there was um, one of my favorite, if somebody pushed me as into, I said my favorite, if I was pushed into my favorite fight of all time from, from an outs overall, it would probably be Nick Diaz and Takanori Gomi. That's that's homework for the Raptors, as well as homework for everybody watching. If you haven't seen that, Nick Diaz like On, six times over but the again, league limit for THC. But again, <laughs> turn the watch, have a little whiskey, a little a, a little tipple, whatever is your tipple. Be relaxed, dim the lights, watch it at night. Couple turn, of candles, yeah, hot bath. Turn the volume up and watch that fight. It's magical. But sorry, getting back to it. If I was pushed to have one fight of my own, it would probably be. Aldo and Mendez too oh. in the Maracazinho in Brazil. The, honestly, it was the most intense. The Maracazinho was like, Zinho was like small. Maracanã, the big famous football stadium. And Maracazinho is the small indoor. It's like a domed roof. At, the point, at that point, Aldo was the last Brazilian with the belt. So you oh, talk about the weight of a nation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> talk to me about pressure. <laughs> he had the the weight of a nation on, on his shoulders, and the fight was just that was Mendez at his best too. Yeah. It was a five round war, you know, a true uh, essence of the of the word war. Mm. The thing the thing I remember about that the the standout memory, and I'm pretty sure it was the first round, is there was a takedown from Mendez, and Aldo just barely touched the canvas. He landed on one hip, he bounced off that hip onto the other and was back to his feet and landed on the left hook and knocked Mendes down. It is one of the best. It, but the first one as well, where he, where he dragged him onto that knee. He was so athletic, wasn't he, yeah, Aldo? Was amazing. But then I would say, like, Johnny, uh, Johnny Walker moves a lot like Aldo does, but as a light heavyweight. It's very... In um, I wouldn't... No? Say, no, because I think Aldo was... No, I wouldn't... I don't know if I agree with that, because I think that... Well, I mean... Everyone's so excited, aren't they, about Johnny mm. Walker because you just don't know what he's going to do next. Yeah. He's so in, unpredictable. I don't think Aldo was ever unpredictable in terms of he was very reg um, solid, you know, technician, amazing technique. Mm. He wouldn't do anything really out of the ordinary. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, technically very proficient. More, more yeah. proficient than Johnny Walker, for sure. But Johnny's like, what, what's he going to do? Yeah. Just you know? that explosiveness, that speedy moves at. I, I'm, maybe I'm saying that because... Uh, it's it's the Aldo in WEC when he was fighting Cub Swanson. He landed that knee, super quick knee, as uh, as, as Swanson was level changing, and that just the way that Johnny uh, that Johnny Walker moves, his, his time and his ability to read where his opponent's going to be before he goes. Oh, okay. Just so don't really yeah. see that at like heavyweight, but yeah. You know, I mean, Josie Aldo, Jose Aldo had his first professional fight in the UK. Yeah, was it Phil Harris? I think it was Phil Harris. He fought yeah. Phil Harris. Yeah, yeah. I he fought that. on. Um, I forgot to say. That's bad news, isn't I it? Imagine say that. FX3. 
I think, I think it right. was FX3. Is that, the, that was the uh, the octagonal ring, wasn't it? Oh, they, a hexagonal ring. They did have a weird, a weird shaped ring. Um, but yeah, I'm sure. I think it was FX3. Might not have been that. But yeah, he definitely had a Paul Daly fight and Sammy Berwick on that. Mm. Remember that? There's a photo of Paul Daly punching Sammy Berwick with a jab and it hit him so hard. Sammy Berwick's head had gone so far back. Oh, it looked like his head had disappeared. It like his head had disappeared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I do remember that. Was, yeah. He was headless. Yeah. Ping. Bump corner. We'll drop that one. Yeah, in the in there. What do you call it? It's good. And obviously, yeah, I remember FX3 was a great show. It was. I remember Paul um, when he, he KO'd Daniel Weichel. Yeah. With an amazing time there. And Daniel Weichel didn't have a good time in the UK. No, he didn't. And he faced you afterwards and he got stopped emphatically mm. both times. But Beat um, me in the first round, though. Huh? Beat me in the first round, though. On the, it was a head on the scorecards going to the second. No, what, are no, no. what are you doing? <laughs> Jimmy Jimmy what are you doing, man? Jimmy Wallen. What are you doing? Yeah, good times, man. Yeah. Good times. Absolutely. Wrap it there. If you're happy, All I'm right. happy. <laughs> yeah, because it could be the last one. So it could be. For the foreseeable, could be. but you understand what I mean by I'm, that, Dan. Yeah, for sure, of course. Well, we know... We're, the mics are here, are here and ready if you want to talk. If you don't, it's no bother. Obviously, you know, I think it's a, you're a massive benefit to the sport, whether you're speaking or not. So as long as you're not, not leaving us anytime soon. Hell you know. no. Um, Listen, I'm just getting stuck. Here's another thing I'm going to do as well when I said I press that reset button. Like I said, just go because I feel I can't win. I'm, I'm not giving in to people that don't want to hear my mouth. They think I've got a big mouth or they think I'm arrogant. And I've always prided myself on the fact that I've been... Uh, you know, Big John's been accessible too, but I was doing it, you know, for a long time. I've, I've tried to make myself accessible. I've put myself out on a plate sometimes and come out publicly, and mm. and I think it's been to my detriment too. What more do people want from me? You know, you call me arrogant when I serve myself up to say that I made a mistake and own up to it publicly. When people, other people, won't even admit fault in private, I'm admitting it publicly. Yeah, yeah, I'm arrogant. Yeah, man. That, like I said, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah. So, like I said, it's not, it's not about those people winning. I just I just want to do this for myself. You know, Twitter back burner. Gr- great place for some things, horrible acidic place for others. Yeah. Um, but that's humanity, isn't it? I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. All right. Episode three in the bags. Maybe we'll have an episode four. Maybe we won't. Who knows. But make sure you're uh, make sure you're giving this man some love online because he deserves it. He works <laughs> fucking hard for this sport. He works fucking hard for this sport. Let me guarantee you that. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.